Welcome to the Solon Vanguard channel. Today we are doing a premium Aquaforce deck profile, which essentially runs like Alexandros deck, but I'll go more in depth in the deck profile. As always, this beautiful playmat maelstrom, as well as light signals, penguin soldier, as well as Tavos, available in the link in the description. So if you're an Aquaforce fan, be sure to pick that up. So getting into the profile, of course, we have three Excel markers. Now, if you feel like running more, you're like really afraid that you may run out, sure, run more. I have my three. I have never gone beyond two. So like three is my safe space. But if you want more, that's fine by me. But getting into the actual deck, we run four Maelstrom. Now, one thing I really have to stress, this is not a Maelstrom deck. I barely run anything from the Maelstrom engine. The only thing this card does is give me an Excel circle. So you could just run this with Naval Gazer. I just run the Maelstrom because it's full art and also because I have the Engulf in my stride zone once. But really, it doesn't really matter. This deck runs like a Tavas deck from at the end of G. That's how this deck is supposed to be played. However, you're never on a Tavas Vanguard. But so this is not a Maelstrom deck. No Elder Moss, no multiple Engulfs, no Helical Disasters, nothing like that. The Maelstrom is purely here as an Excel creator so that you can then abuse that Excel circle with the Alexandros. The next up, we have four Tavas. Now, we don't run this to ride it. As I said, we don't run the Tavas engine either. We don't run Shipra, we don't run Adelaide. We're not trying to have this on our Vanguard. We're essentially using him for his rear guard skill, which is basically a tidal assault that doesn't lose any power. So it's really potent to actually have this thing on an Excel circle and just swing 21 twice unboosted without any power gains, just like that. But usually, he will actually be gigantic because you use your Alexandros together with him to have a 65k swing twice and stuff like that. This is essentially fulfilling the role Adelaide used to fulfill in the Tavas deck. So look at him like an Adelaide rather than like a Tavas. Next we run two Diamantes. This is basically the hybrid between the Maelstrom and the Tavas. He is that double swinger, just like Tavas, fulfilling that Adelaide-ish role while simultaneously being an Excel creator if you're on Vanguard. The reason I run so many grade threes is because first of all, my grade threes are really valuable pieces. Both Diamantes and Tavas are pieces I want to see, otherwise we don't have enough restanders, but also because we want to be riding and re-riding to get the Excel circles and still have to stride. So our grade threes fulfill so many roles at the same time that I choose to run many. Now, some people may be going, oh, but why don't you run four Diamantes as your Vanguard to create Excel, but also great as your rear guard? Well, the reason for that is Megiddo is a really, really good finisher in this deck. And so if you run four Diamantes, and you already rode one, but then he also has to be a piece on the field, you will generally not have one in your hand for the cost of stride. Whereas right now with Maelstrom, Maelstrom is so worthless on rear guard that I will always keep him in my hand for the Megiddo. And then I can still use my Diamantes as the actual rear guard. And you can't do that vice versa. So again, essentially, this is fulfilling the same role Adelaide or Tidal Assault would do. Next up, we run for Tidal Assault, of course. He's the star of the deck just like he's always been basically in Aqua Force. He's free as hell. We don't want to run the new Tidal Assault because many people don't seem to notice, but you may go, oh, he doesn't lose a 9k on first wave, meaning early he's extra good because you could go nine, Vanguard nine, without going nine, Vanguard four, or with a booster behind it, that was awkward, right? So you wanted that early game, some people may say. The problem is he doesn't actually work like an old title in the late game. Some people think that the new title still swings 9-4, but he doesn't. If it's not first battle, he swings 4-4. Four, four. He actually loses that 4k the second you choose to use his restand, meaning that's way weaker. Like on first stride, he never hits that way. And you're also using Soul. So title, the old one, is basically superior in many, many ways. That's why we run him over the new one. And again, just like I said with the Tavas, this is Alexandros deck. This deck wants to use a restander on an Excel circle 
swing first with this, swing with your Alexandros, re-stand it, and then have two swings on an Excel circle, usually like 40, 40, 50, 50, 60, 60, just huge swings. And so this title, together with the Diamantes, together with the Tavas, make sure you always have that re-stander to go for those skill turns. Next up, the best unit in this entire deck for Saber Flow. Now, note how I never want to ride Tavas, which means I never have a Tavas Vanguard, which means I never have Shipra nor Melania. And the only reason Tavas was actually decent in G was because they had really good draw cards in Melania and Shipra. Without those, you essentially miss pieces 24-7. So Saber Flow is the only way you get access to pieces. She's the only way to keep your battles going while simultaneously fueling hand. Finally, and I hate this slot, I run two high tight sniper. And the reason is there is nothing better. Essentially, because we no longer have Shipra, because we no longer have Melania, we never have a back row. We never have the resources to call a back row. So every single card in this deck will generally be good on the front row apart from one. So generally, when you see this deck in action, you will see a full front row of gigantic beat sticks and not a single card in the back row. Because not only did we lose the ability to attack from the back row, like with Commander Tavas, like with the Tavas Grade 3, we also simply don't have the resources to call any boosters. So what High Tide Sniper does is essentially be a tiny beat stick that doesn't need a booster. That's all he does. So here will be your Vanguard, and then you're going for a Tidal, a Tidal, then your Vanguard swings, re-stand them, they're huge, and then you go for your Saber Flow because you want free draws, and your High Tide is essentially just an extra swing, another way to fill a rear guard spot. Apart from that, it would be very unwise to only play four Tidal for Saber Flow and no other great twos, because, well, you wouldn't have enough ride targets. But apart from being a right target and just poking, High Tide does absolutely nothing. And there is essentially no better thing to put in that spot, as sad as that is. I would love to find one. Like, if you have some kind of hidden tech that I'm forgetting about, do tell me. But I have thought about so many. So first of all, one of the things many people will say is, oh, just add the Shipra. Because what some people want to do is they want to write the Maelstrom and then they think next turn they'll be able to write the Tavas and then they'll be able to take the Shipra and start plusing. Well, here's the deal. In premium, you're dead on the second or third stride, usually you know, like your opponent's second stride. So that means you don't have the time for this. Apart from that, you also only get one draw of her. Like sure, you could try to restand her with Alexandros, but then you don't get your double restands on your Excel circles since you're already wasting a counter blast, restanding a Shipra, and then trying to get a draw of her. It's just really awkward that you would think that you have the time and the resources to just get that Shipra value. You never want to do this. Why would you do this when you could also just ride yet another Maelstrom over that, get your second Excel circle, put another restander there, and basically force your opponent to drop 60k extra guard? There is no reason why you would ever want this to get the one draw of Shipra. So no, Shipra is not an option in the way this deck works at least. So that's why we have two High Tide Sniper. Magnum Assault is also ass because we never have boosters. Again, you don't have the resources to call them. Don't forget, back in the Tavas days, we had Melania and Shipra fueling our hands. And we also didn't have an extra Excel circle to fill. Right now we do. So that's an extra minus one to hand just to start using the Excel circle. Honestly, I would have heavily preferred if Aqua Force was forced because it wouldn't force us to fill fields in awkward ways and we could still use something like an Ortia behind a force steroided circle and be like even better off. So really sad that it's Excel actually after testing. But with that being said, Magnum Assault doesn't work because you don't have boosters. Now Elder Moss is something some people may say, well, first of all, that's a counter blast for a thing that attacks from the back row, but you don't have the resources to fill a back row. So why would you put an Elder Moss there? And then you're also just trying to fuel your soul with Maelstroms, which you usually won't have in drop because again, games end too quickly, hoping for some awkward kill turn on Engulf, even though Alexandros just has way better kill turns. So no, Elder Moss doesn't actually work 
either. So honestly, I'm at a loss as to what to put in these two. So far, High Tide is doing really well. Like I'm just with this deck pretending I don't have a back row and High Tide is just being the good beat stick he is in that game plan. Next up, of course, for Stride Fodder, our grade 3s are actually engine pieces. Tava's grade 3, Diamantis grade 3. We want to keep them on our field and we don't want to use them to stride. So Kelpie Rider Nikki makes sure that we're able to stride without losing those really valuable pieces. Apart from that, again, we don't call boosters, so why would we waste grade 1s on awkward boosters and stuff like that? Next up, the only grade 1 actually breaking that one rule I have of not having boosters, Penguin, because he's not actually a booster. Essentially what Penguin does is do what Supersonic Sailor and Galphilia used to do, which is counter charge. Generally, we want to win on second stride, so every time we use a Galphilia, which is our unflipping G-Guard, we are essentially losing the 5k pressure Alexandros gives because we have one less open in G-Zone. By not having to flip Galphilia, we're actually adding pressure to the deck. We also lost Supersonic Sailor because we want to run new triggers, which means this guy is basically our on-demand counter charger just like that. And more importantly, he's also an Excel Circle Light, if that makes sense. Now, take this thing for example. Let's say we have our Tidal Assault and we don't have enough Excel Circles or something like that and we create this column. If we had a regular booster, he would swing unboosted, then he would restand, lose his power, he would swing boosted. What's so amazing about Penguin is that you can just use a skill, give the power, and he will swing twice with that power. It's much better, especially when we consider the card Saber Flow. Because what your first stride usually looks like is you will have a title on Excel Circle maybe, and you will have your Saber Flow. And these two units will be the units that you restand with Alexandros. Now, normally what this would play out like is that you swing with Tidal and then you swing with Saber Flow and Saber Flow wouldn't hit. Saber Flow would just be there to plus somehow, which is both fine because she really pluses well, but also awful because she doesn't hit. So what we are now able to do is have our Penguin behind her do this at the 5 and now she will be going as a 13k base and can essentially hit force, protect, excel, old, everything because she's 13 which is the base vanguard power, the highest base vanguard power let's say. So like I said it's an excel circle light, it adds 5k to the unit on a circle but it adds that 5k permanently and you can just keep on abusing that. So even when it's not a saber flow, when it's just a title, that's a 14 now. It swings at the Vanguard for a 14. It restands with Alexandros. It goes for that 14 or boosted with Wow over power again and then goes again. So this way, you always have Excel circles, well, smaller ones essentially. Now, apart from that, what Penguin also does and what Galphilia and Supersonic couldn't do is counter charge in the battle phase. And that is insane. Both Artavas and Diamantes are paid right then and there. Meaning, when you run out of counter blast, you can use your penguin to give you your counter charge and you can start spending it with these two again without any issues. So even if you have only one counter blast, you are able to spend it on Alexandros, get it back with Penguin and then spend it on Tavas, which is absolutely nuts. Trust me, it's really relevant in a lot of matchups and there are a lot of situations where you don't have all that counter blast and you don't really want to flip down your Galphilia because it will weaken your Ale Alexandro's turn. So Penguin is just really good, really solid card. He does everything the grade one spot wants to do. And even when you don't need him, let's say you have plenty of counter blast, you know you're gonna get enough power with Alexandros and so forth, then he's still a 10k shield because it's one of the new units. Next up, and again, I'm proving I'm not gonna use boosters, we have our Influent Dagger. Now, some people are ignoring this guy in standard and you'd be crazy to ignore him in standard, but in premium, he's really interesting as well. So, as I said, we don't have a lot of resources. We have trouble filling up our circles. And so let's say you had any other grade one here, something you want to be boosting with like Teo or Viviana or Ortia or anything like that. What you're essentially doing 
is you're leaving open a front circle in order to power up a back circle with a booster. Influent Dagger, instead of taking cards from your hand to fill up the back row, this card fills up a front row. Because let's say again, we have our setup, we have an Excel circle, let's say even just one. We have our Influent Dagger, we have our Tavas here, we have our Saber Flow, and then we have some kind of stride on there. What you're able to do is, you would swing with Saber Flow, maybe even boosted by Penguin with the 5k or not, doesn't really matter. 21, swing with Alex, re-stand these two, swing with Tavas, swing with Tavas again, swing with Saber Flow, and then right now, instead of having this thing awkwardly here in the back row and this empty spot that's not creating any pressure, you have an extra attacker because he gets 3k for every battle starting from 3 and you just had Alexandro Stava Stava Saber Flow which was 4 battles right there so that's 12k plus to him. Apart from that he said when your unit attacks which means he is your unit as well so on his swing beyond the third he also gets some more power so usually he's swinging for a lot especially when you then factor in another Excel circle with something else on here. Let's say another restander, which makes it completely nuts. Then he'll just be one of your biggest attackers out there. So right there, you have essentially an even better high tide sniper that fills up your front row and swings for big numbers while your double restanders do most of the work. But this is one of those swings where they really empty their hands on those double restands from Alex. And then suddenly you're like, oh yeah, this one is 22 as well and that really catches people off guard. Apart from that, just like with Penguin, this is 10k guard. If you're able to fill up your front because everything went great, you can still use him as basically the same shield value as one of the older triggers. Finally, and this spot is interesting because when I finished the deck, let's say, I had one spot left. I had one spot and I was like, well, I hate decks. I absolutely hate decks, but High Tide, isn't that great. High Tide by himself, like he's just there to make sure I don't miss my grade 2 right that often. But beyond that, I didn't want to add just another High Tide. I wanted to have enough grade 1s so I don't miss rides that often, that hard. And so I needed one more tech grade 1. And apart from that, I also noticed I barely use Soul because first of all, I only run two High Tides. So usually, I don't really use Soul with him that much. You also rewrite with Maelstrom. You have your Bubble Edge going into Soul. So generally your Soul is really packed. You also use your Light Signals Penguin Soldier, so you don't have to use Soul for Galphilia, your G Guard, which means your Soul is plenty. However, you use a lot of Counter Blast. You use your Alexandros, you use your Tavas, you use your Diamantes, you use plenty of Counter Blast. And the less you have to flip down your Galphilia, well, the more you can go batshit crazy. So that's why I used this little fellow, our Jellyfish Soldier. Really one of my favorite cards since Jay, the guy who tops everything with Gear Chronicle, introduced me to him like months and months and months ago. He's a really old card, but he essentially changes two soul into two counter blasts. By himself, he makes it so you don't have to flip down Galphilia twice. Two counter blasts just for free. So this one, well, the only grade one I would basically call in the back row apart from Penguin Soldier. And it's only because I know I'm gonna call him. Sure, I lose 5k guard, but I get two counter blasts, which will give me my Alexandro's attacks, my Tava's attacks. If someone wants to go, oh, I'm not gonna give him enough counter blasts for next turn, and I just go, well, fuck you, I have this guy. So it's a one of tech because if you see two, you will never have enough soul for him. So you can only make him go off once, ever. So the one is fine. If I don't see him, it's usually not a problem. If I do see him, I know, well, I can be as aggressive as I want with my counter blast because it's all gonna come back anyway. And I don't use soul on anything else. That's the great thing about not having Adelaide anymore. Not having Adelaide kind of sucks, but not having her means I always have the soul for everything I want, including this little guy right here. So that's the one off tech. Now, if there's some crazy great two, that people come up with or that comes out that can replace the high tide and is so amazing i may turn two high tides and this guy into that gray too but for now i don't see any such thing also notice how this video is super fucking long well that's because i love this clan like to death so uh i've been testing a lot 
I've been trying a lot and I really, really like this build. I hope you enjoy me actually giving so much information rather than my quick video profiles I usually do. It's because, well, you know, this is premium. So first of all, you have way more depth, way more things to consider. But then also, well, it's the clan I played for ages. So now next up, we have our four supersonic sailors, the new one. Now, some people may be going crazy right now. Why no front? Well, I will tell you, no fronts are coming whatsoever. We are playing eight crits, eight of the new crits. Now, before you go crazy, let me explain. Fronts are awesome, yeah. But what's even more awesome is your opponent catching on and going on your vanguard, no guard, because they know you only play fronts. And so none of your swings matter. In the early game, you go with your grade two, check a trigger, front. It does absolutely nothing. This deck can't rush. Some people may go like, oh, but Aqua Force rushes so much. The problem is, if you rush, meaning you call your Algos, you call your title, you are gonna die because you will not have pieces in your stride game. The second you start striding, but you used your titles or algos if you run that for some reason in your early game, they're gone. Any good player will nuke the shit out of those cards. And so you get to striding and boom, you have some triggers in hand, nothing, you auto lose. You have your vanilla stride. There you go, have fun. So we don't rush. The only damage we get in early is critical damage. And apart from that, fronts may be boosting or tiny attacks, but those tiny attacks don't win you games. What does win you games is the most crazy, you had a title assault, and that title assault is gonna swing twice for 50k with a crit. Good luck, have fun protecting that. Crits basically make it, so first of all, you get early damage in, which mitigates their defensive triggers, so you get that early damage. It makes it so people can't just no guard your vanguard at three damage because they know, fuck, I could lose right now, which makes them overextend guard. Whereas if they know you're gonna run quite some forces or only forces, like, okay, come at me, bro. It's not gonna do anything. Crits stop that whole thing. And it makes it so at no point people can stop your huge swings and just go, okay, no guard at one swing, I get my defensive trigger and I start guarding everything else because they know that one title swing is coming with two crits and end the game right there. I have tested this enough. Fronts are fun, in theory. I love to have my whole field be big and go like, oh, now defensive triggers don't matter. You win with 60k swings from all over the place. You don't win with your tiny pokes. This is not blue wave. As much as I would like for that to be the case, and in ripples, it's definitely the case. I will be doing a premium ripples deck soon. There you do do the tiny pokes and stuff, but even then you play crits. But you're not gonna win on your many pokes. You're gonna win on your Tidal Assault or your Tavas going in for 60k with two crits and they go, okay, too bad, I lose. Apart from that, and that's something people seem to overlook, fronts give 10k to the front row. Crits give 10k to a piece as well. So people go like, oh, but your whole front row, sure. But when you have your Excel circle, you're essentially giving your Saber Flow maybe 10k and then another unit 10k. But that title there, the one attack, well the two attacks that actually matter are being boosted by these critical triggers anyway, just as much as a front would. But they're at least giving that extra critical. So that's why here in Premium, this matters. Apart from that, and this is like even more important, the meta right now is basically Ansh, Odete Gize and then a few more other decks. But the one thing you have to be really afraid of is Odete Gize. And the only way to get respect from that deck is crits. Because you will be able to push them on second stride and win. This is actually one of the few ways to actually win that Odete Gize match. Maybe. Because it's actually one of the most painful matches out there. Regardless, crits are the way to go. Uh, I'm really passionate about this because I actually had quite some discussions about this with age old and then we both tested and then it ended up well Yeah, crits all the way. I'm frustrated, you know, because I was in the front camp. I love fronts They they are everything aqua force ever wanted and yet for some reason they don't work out like on paper Next up you saw the grade ones already. So here are four draw PGs Essentially it gives us draws and draws are fine and then we also have our PGs. PGs are great. It opens up grade one slots for that influent dagger, for that light signals penguin soldier. And apart from that, some people may go, maybe going, 
But what about Ichitom? Well, the thing with Ichitom is that if they get to that, you lose anyway. You have to win on first or second stride. You have to guard early so their first Ichi doesn't kill you straight away. And then you have to win right then and there. Regardless of if you have grade 1 PGs or something, you are not winning based on your grade 1 PGs. You are gonna win because you smacked the shit out of them before they could do that to you. And draw PGs make it so you can play pieces and do just that. Four heals right here, the new ones. Some people may be going, oh, but my counter charge and my soul charge heal is so fun, I like to play 2-2. Two, 2-2 two. Two, two is very fun on paper because you think, well, if my first heal, the big one, is in the drop and I G-guard with the other one, then I can still bind those two and get my counter charge and so I can have my cake and eat it too because I have the power from these and the counter charge from the other. Well, here's where that theory falls flat on its face. What if, and this is gonna be a huge mind blow, this one is in your hand and the other one goes into your drop zone first. You didn't get the power and you didn't get the counter charge and the soul charge. So just like that, 2-2, completely fucked you. So that's why we play these, because we want that power. We're not playing fronts. Seeing this and giving that sweet 10k to that title wins you games. And so, sure, we won't have the counter charge or the soul charge. Well, first of all, we don't use soul. Second of all, we just put our whole main deck full of counter charge. And even if that's not enough, we have Galphelia. So like, there's no reason to be playing that when we could have the extra power on our big ass rear guards. Finally, starter, Bobolich. Bobolich is still awesome. This is the one thing that I do want to debate on. Well, apart from some other choices, sure, but like this is one thing that I'm meh, I'm not really sure. It's really meta dependent. Basically, if you know you are gonna see decks that are gonna blow this one up, you should play the new one. You should be playing, is it Eric? Alex? Eric? I think it's Eric. Well, the guy with the little dolphins in the background, you should be playing him because you will get your guaranteed draw, you will keep your soul awesome. However, the drawback is that you don't get your booster behind your vanguard and that's actually really handy to get some early damage in because that forces them to sometimes throw two guard to no pass rather than throw one guard. And with throwing one guard to not be critted to your face is awesome, but having to throw two, that's not worth it. So not having the booster from the new starter really hurts. So if you can run this one, knowing that it won't get retired, go for Bubble Edge. But if you know your meta is gonna retire him, change it into the new one. Bubble Edge, as always, is super awesome because you get two draws on your first try. Basically, you will have your Excel circle, you will have your grade three, where is he? There we are. You will have your grade three Tavas on here. You use your bubble edge, go into soul, and then he will swing on fourth and on fifth, and you will get two draws just like that, which is much better than Eric, because not only did you have your booster, you also got two draws instead of one. So that's why we play our bubble edge, and I am never gonna stop playing him unless, like I said, the meta requires it of me. Getting into the G zone, we have our Megiddo. Megiddo is probably the most hilarious Zerov dragon ever. Basically, I have been loving Megiddo ever since he came out. I didn't like his art, but I loved his skill. And actually the art even dawned on me because now I'm just in love with this card all around. It's interesting how many people said this card wasn't that good. Like when he came out in the anime, people were going, what the fuck, this card is end all be all. Then people started theory crafting and were like, eh, he's not that good, Drachma is better. Well now Drachma is fucking ass and this guy, took the throne that he always deserved. Why? Well, first of all, we just have to look at the two supported Magalanica clans, Grand Blue and Aqua Force. In Grand Blue, this card by himself created a new archetype deck together with Skull Dragon that basically always wins on Megiddo. And in Aqua Force, he only got better because of the Excel Circle. Megiddo by himself was never a bad card. The problem was that he was very susceptible to defensive triggers because Getting even one defensive trigger of 5k already nullified the power gains of the 5k he gave. And then it was just like, guard that with 5k, guard that with 5k, guard that with 5k, and now you lose your G-zone. Oh no, now what? Well, now we have this Excel circle, which is a little hilarious because Megiddo allows you to play something and then you swing with a 10k power boost, swap positions with another unit, put another unit in that 10k, swing, swap it again, and basically you let your whole field 
go through that Excel circle, get that 10K and that 5K from him. And you basically have a bunch of bigger attacks. So Megiddo just got a 10K upgrade because of the existence of Excel circle on every single attack. Essentially, when you read Megiddo, you shouldn't be reading these units get plus five. You should be reading these units get plus 15. And that is a whole lot scarier, especially when you still have counter blast for stuff like Tavas and for stuff like Diamantes. And you usually do, because here's the fun part. When Megiddo came out, he says, call five, and that was your whole field. Now that is no longer your whole field. So you are able to add a card that counter charges to this whole thing, because you have one open space anyway, and that way get your extra attacks of Diamantes and Tavas with the counter blast that you didn't have in the past because in the past your whole field was filled so you could no longer add counter chargers now you can because of megiddo so essentially this is a really good finisher he's our backup finisher if everything goes like back in the day if everything goes wrong and going into megiddo you weren't really sure that you were gonna win now if everything goes wrong and you go into megiddo you're probably gonna win anyway. Next up, we have two Lambros. This is essentially second stride Alexandros or first stride Alexandros if you G-guard it, but without paying the counter blast cost. Apart from that, he's also easier to hit because we now have the Excel circle, meaning you hit your four battles without having to re-stand or without having to attack from the back row. Finally, if Gize is gonna deny you counter blast, Lambros still gives you swings. One flood hazard, if everything goes wrong, this card still gives you four drive checks, which is just a bigger plus. Generally, you never ever go into it, but it's there just in case. It's also cool in the Link Joker matchup, not that that really happens anymore, but it's just if everything goes wrong, there's really no better stride to stride into when you're totally fucked. I have one more tech slot. This tech slot could either be a Wailing Tavas, or an Engulf Maelstrom. Both guard restrict in their own way, but both are almost never ever relevant. I'm sorry Maelstrom fans, it's just the case. You can Elder Moss and stuff all you want. Generally, meta decks will kill you on second stride before this thing ever becomes relevant. I know he can be fun, he's a cool gimmick, but overall I don't think Maelstrom purely focused Aqua Force is gonna be the way, unless some really insane shit comes out, someone comes up with something crazy, but I don't think it will. I've tried it plenty myself. So this card is just a one-off deck. If you see, hey, my opponent is playing draw PGs and nothing else, and I for some reason can't build what I need for Alexandros, I don't know, I don't even know what kind of reason you can come up with but he will then just guard restrict and you hope you win that way with that being said let's go into the star of the show three alexandros generally if everything goes right you will just be striding him and only him and you won't even see the rest of your g-zone because he's so good that's why i said at the very beginning of this deck profile Alexandros.deck. Just having that Excel circle and even one piece, just a title on here, or a Tavas. Let's say we have, uh, we have a Tavas, that's the first thing I found. You're on your Alex, you go 21, Alexandros, restand, and then you go with whatever power it gives, I don't know, 40k, something, you really hit 40k. So then you just go, well, uh, 61, 61, and you win. You put some crits on there, you win. Even with just this setup, usually you have way more. Usually if you have some saber flows, some influence, some high tide, maybe an extra one of this, then you do the, the thing twice, basically. This deck relies on double restands with Alexandros. And so usually you only need two, sometimes you only need one, but three is there just in case. Maybe you're going up against a really slow stall-ish deck. And so then you go for that third one, if that's really relevant. We also have one Sea Breeze. Uh, doesn't really come up that often, but it's in there. Some people still believe that Sea Breeze doesn't work now with the new stride rules. Uh, try it for yourself, it absolutely does. Every other card is a G-guard. And now some people were already calling me crazy when I said that more than four was likely because they went, well, but you can only use four in total, right? Well, yeah, that's true but you can only use two or three strides max in a game anyway. So why are you running so many? Because you want options. And that's what G-Guards give, options. Apart from that, if you have the flip G-Guards, which we want to abuse in this deck, because Alexandros gives more power with phase-up G-Guards, you will sometimes have G-Guarded into something like this, and then G-Guard with Ihoanes back-to-back, 
and have your 5G cards open after the attack just like that. So yes, you can go beyond your 4 and then also you want options. That's the only reason you run so many strides anyway. So I already kind of spoiled what I run. We have one Ice Barrier Dragon, basically creates 36k. If you go up against a deck that swings with Vanguard first, this is still relevant. It's still the freest way to get 36k. Apart from that, many decks have multi-attacks now. It's just really free and it comes up really often to just have your 36, actually 37 now with the new numbers. Then we have one Dismal from Comic Fiesta. Nice promo right there. As I said, this deck is peace reliant. You want your Tidal Assault, you want your Tavas, and this guy basically protects that for free so that's why he's here i really don't care that i have to run him over another commander tavas i am never gonna stride a commander tavas i am much happier that i have this option rather than having the option to go into a stride i will never go into so that's why we have this dismal right here save your tile assault or your tavas in case someone realizes that they need to keep attacking it one rectome I run this in almost every single deck I own. This card is great because what it essentially allows you to do is filter through the deck. This is essentially a jar of greed or an upstart goblin if you ever played Yu-Gi-Oh. You've got something worthless in your hand, no problem. You just G-guard, get rid of the worthless thing and get another chance to grab something greater. In a deck where pieces are so important, being able to ditch something worthless for a potential piece is huge. Then we have two Iho Anes. Basically, the skill is fun. Like, usually you have a big field. You will usually get some good guard out of it. But that's not the main reason why you run it. The main reason why you run it is because it flips something. And as you know, Alexandros pumps more power by having stuff phase up. So by using Ioannis sometimes two times in a row, back to back, you are able to turbo through your G-zone so your Alexandros gives way more power to your double restanders. That's why I actually cut some of my other strides so I could run two of this because it actually comes up. Finally, two more spots for two Galphilia. This card is still amazing. It unlocks, that's not really relevant right now, but what it does do is it's 20k on the second battle and third battle, but more importantly, you can flip it up with Alexandros and then you can flip it back down to get some counter charge or you can G-guard so it's up and then flip it back down for some counter charge. So this card basically allows you to get counter charge when it's really needed. Like I said earlier, you don't really want to do this. Ideally, you always have infinite counter blast to use, but that's not a reality. So having the option of always having counter blast is absolutely broken because your opponent may be able to deny you damage but you can just say fuck you i have galphilia that's why this card is so amazing that's usually the thing you're gonna flip up first so you have your alexandros he forces you to flip something up you flip up a galphilia so that no matter what your opponent tries to damage deny you or anything you have that galphilia so they know a good player will know well i can damage deny but they will just go whoop Galphilia, back down, get your counter charge back, and you're back on track. So just the existence of Galphilia right there will make it so a good player is less likely to damage deny you. And by making that less likely, she's staying phase up anyway, so you get your power anyway. So then if a bad player damage denies you, which is rare, but if they do, you can just go, okay, boop, and you have your counter charge right there. And as I said, because of Penguin, you only need one counter blast to do your whole damn turn and win. Because that's actually the cool thing about not needing Shepra and Melania or Adelaide. You barely use that much counter blast anyway. Like back in Tavas G, you would eat to three or four like crazy. And then you would need your supersonics and this one and heals and stuff just to get your counter blast back. Now, now you really don't. That was actually one reason why Megiddo was also worse in Tavas G was because you usually didn't even have the counter blast for it. Apart from that, Tavas Grade 3 was your main right target, but it was also your best rear guard, which meant that you didn't want to keep it in hand. Now, we actually have a card. Uh, I don't know if you know him, but he's called uh, Maelstrom, and he's your right target. So you want to keep him in hand because is, he's an awful rear guard. And so because of that, you always have access to ultimate stride. This being a horrible rear guard and the whole deck not needing counter blast and then also having this 
makes it so you can always go into Megiddo. That's actually why Megiddo is so much better in this version than back in Tavas G. So that is basically all for today. That is my Aquaforce deck profile, my Alexandros dot deck. That is all. Hope you found this interesting. If you did, make sure to like, leave a comment, let me know your thoughts. Uh, let me know if this video is way too long. As always, zero damage gaming. If you don't have a playmat yet, if you want a really cool playmat for whatever deck you play, Grand Blue, Dimension Police, Aqua Force, mm -mm -mm. Uh, we have it all. Link in the description. I will see you soon. Ciao.